Hi and welcome to the channel Love Obstetrics and Gynecology. After having a clear indication for the application of forceps in a delivery, we need to fulfill the prerequisites of an operative vaginal delivery. So let's go through those prerequisites and I'll be starting right from the consent of the patient. Before even that consent, we should be having three factors clear in our mind. The first is our facility should be fully prepared, equipped for a operative vaginal delivery. The second thing is in case the operative vaginal delivery fails, we have our preparedness for a cesarean section. And the third thing is pelvic assessment. See, we have already uh, assessed this patient before uh, in latent phase of labor or in active labor. So we know that grossly the patient has having a pelvis that is grossly adequate and there is no cephalopelvic disproportion. Though we are going to again assess the pelvis before the application of forceps. So starting with the consent of the patient, we take a written informed consent when we explain the situation to the patient and the relatives regarding why we need the operative vaginal delivery in her case and what are the risks and benefits associated with it and finally in case our operative vaginal delivery is not successful we also have to explain that we need to go for a cesarean section. Varying amount of maternal and fetal risks are involved in operative vaginal delivery and specifically talking about the forceps delivery Maternal trauma is more in comparison to the fetal trauma. Maternal perineal tears, they can happen and in the longer term, we, if we talk about, we, the patient can have UV prolapse. And if we talk about the baby, see, baby, the injuries to the fetus are rare. And why they are rare? Because it actually forms a protective cage to a head so that it is delivered very safely. But yes, there can be um, fetal injuries in case it is not an exact cephalopelvic application and they can include injury to the skull or to the eyeball. Those can happen. Next, we need a skilled obstetrician to perform the operative vaginal delivery, which increases the chances of uh, the success of operative vaginal delivery and also minimizes the risks. Also, we need to have the pediatrician and anesthetist available with us because, see, uh, the baby can be in distress. Uh, that may be an indication for the delivery and also, you know, just post-operative delivery, uh, the baby might need some care. So, a pediatrician availability is required. Then also, anesthetist is required. Firstly is to provide the analgesia in case we have, you know, we have, the patient is going for operative vaginal delivery under epidural analgesia. So definitely we require anesthetics and in case our operative delivery is not successful, we need to go for a cesarean section and again the anesthetics will be required. Now coming on to the examination. First we ask the patient to evacuate the bladder or pass urine. Next we lie her in the dorsal lithotomy position in the stirrups. Then we perform a per abdomen assessment. In the per abdomen assessment, we go for all the detailed per abdomen assessment, but there are three main important points. First is uterine contractions should be present. Second, the head should be engaged. And third, we assess the fetal heart sound. So we know whether there is any fetal distress or not. Then on the per vaginum examination, the cervix should be fully dilated, the membranes should be ruptured, the exact fetal station is known to us. That is, you know, for the outlet forceps, uh, the prerequisite for that outlet forceps is that the fetal head should be at the perineum. Then the fetal skull has reached the pelvic floor. The scalp of the fetus is visible without separating the labia. And we also assess the sutures, the sagittal suture on the fetal skull. That should be in, uh, you can say in the exactly parallel to the AP diameter or to an angle that is less than 45 degrees, whether that is a right occipital anterior position or left occipital anterior position. Also, we can have a occipital posterior position. But we cannot apply the outlet forceps it is a, if it is a transverse position. And also the pelvic assessment is very important basically to rule out the cephalopelvic disproportion. 
See here the talking about the outlet forceps basically. The fetal head has already crossed the pelvic inlet and also crossed the ischial spines. So we are talking about just the pelvic outlet. So here we are not going to focus upon the pelvic outlet. Is the outlet adequate for a forceps delivery? So what are we going to assess in that? The pubic ankle, pubic arc, the transverse diameter of outlet and the sacrococcygeal joints mobility. So first let's talk about the subpubic angle and the subpubic arc. See, in a gynecoid pelvis, we have around 85 to 90 degrees subpubic angle in comparison to the android pelvis which has a narrow degree angle. So almost like this, uh, abducted index and the abducted thumb. This is almost uh, resembles the gynecoid pelvis. Around this we have a 85 to 90 degree angle gynecoid pelvis having a subpubic angle. And how we are going to assess it? The subpubic arc should be round and the subpubic angle should be able to admit the palmar aspect of two fingers, the finger breadth that is the index finger and the middle finger. So that should be able to accommodate here and it should be round and wide. In comparison to our android pelvis, see Android pelvis is basically resembling our abducted index finger and the middle finger. So here we won't be able to do the same. The palmar aspect of the these two fingers won't be able to admit in this angle which were here available in a wider angle. The next thing we assess is the sacrococcygeal joints mobility. So it is down right below. Here, in case the coccyx is pointing anteriorly, if it is mobile enough, as the fetal head is going to descend, it is going to fall backwards and increase our AP angle by almost 1 to 2 cm. Next, we are going to talk about the transverse diameter of outlet. See, that is between the two ischial tuberosities. And how we assess them? See, this is our subpubic angle and this is our subpubic arc and it ends on the ischial tuberosities. So we press on the patient's perineum with a fist and these four knuckles should be able to admit between the two ischial tuberosities. So again revising all those points, we have the subpubic angle, the subpubic arc, the sacrococcygeal joint, the walls should be parallel to each other and the transverse diameter of outlet should be able to accommodate four knuckles to rule out a cephalopelvic disproportion. For remembering these prerequisites, we have a mnemonic uh, that is by the name of forceps, but um, I prefer it by stepwise manner that is first we go for the consent, then we require the manpower that is our skilled obstetrician, anesthetist, pediatrician and the equipment for the operative vaginal delivery. Next, we go for the examination where we do a per abdomen assessment, per vaginal assessment, pelvic assessment and that fulfills all our prerequisites. So this was all about the prerequisites for a forceps delivery. Stay tuned to the channel for the next videos on the application of forceps and the complications related to the delivery. Thanks for watching.